Welcome to our Christmas Eve service. It's good to see everyone this evening. Uh, glad that you are here. And I wanted to share with you, when you came in, you probably saw your 2020 appropriate uh, materials sitting in your chair, and it might need some instructions. Uh, one, you have the prepackaged communion, which we'll do uh, later as a part of our, our service. And then you'll see the candle. And when the time to light the candle, what we're going to do is actually after you take communion in your seat, just as you want to, as you can, socially distance, come up and light your candle and return to your seat. We, normally we do a circle this time, just return back to your seat. And because 2020 has been such a rough year, the shot glasses are for the whiskey that we're going to hand out. <laughs> no, actually what those are for is we were trying to think of 
what's the best way to put the candles out? Because if we all take our masks off and blow on the candles, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of all this. So take your, your communion cup and put the, turn it over and put the, the, uh, the candle out that way, unless you're John Norris, which will probably be a manly man and put it out with your fingers or something. But uh, regardless of that, that's the opportunity we want to present to you, the prepackaged communion, the opportunity to come and light the candle. Uh, and this, as I said, it'll be a part of our, our time together uh, later on in this evening. Let's, let's have a word of prayer as we begin our time. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the ways you've blessed us. We thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight. We thank you for the gift that you've given to us through your son. And we pray, Lord, that tonight will be a time that we can focus on your goodness and that we can be drawn to you and to one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this evening. Amen. 
Go ahead and have a seat. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went out to the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there. He went there. <laughs> he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Christmas Eve. This is the 11th Christmas Eve service that I've been a part of at Christ Covenant Church. It's the 10th time that I've shared a sermon, so to speak, when the uh, pinch hit for me in 2016, the days after my dad's accident. And as I've said before, Christmas and Easter are two really great times in the church calendar. But for a preacher, they are a bit problematic. Because each Christmas and each Easter, that's sort of the showtime, right, of the church. That's the time that we shine, where our friends and family come, and we, we celebrate the two most important events in all of history. And the problem, if it is a problem, I guess you can't call it a problem, but the problem for a preacher is that you already know the story. You know the story of Easter, you know the story of Christmas, and so to have something that, that, uh, that, that, that tweaks your, that your, your, uh, your curiosity and that draws you closer to God, there's a lot of pressure for a preacher. And Christmas Eve is no exception. So I went back and I considered some of the Christmas Eve sermons I've delivered in the past. And what I found is that there was a frequent and common theme, the things that I said on December 24th in the evening with you. And the common theme was anticipation. Anticipation. You have the anticipation of Mary and Joseph. All they went through, the angels speaking to them, the, the hesitation on Joseph's part, part to... I just said part of Christmas Eve, sir. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and own that. So, we're not doing this yet. So, the, the anticipation and the, the hesitation on Joseph's heart, say that five times faster than the same as they got it. And, and, and you see, they made it all through that. They got to Bethlehem. And the anticipation of, of the child finally arriving. I, before I talked about this, the anticipation of Simeon and Anna, who were waiting in the temple. For the baby Jesus to come to be consecrated. We have God the Father. The anticipation that God had. That finally it was time for his son to be born on the earth. And I compared that to my own anticipation. Thinking about Nathan when he was born. And the, the excitement that led up to that. And of course, uh, Lady and Riley as well. 
And I think about us waiting for the excitement of Christmas, the anticipation of, of normal years when we get to have a family in our homes and share that time together. And then, of course, there's the anticipation we all have experienced at some point, most likely, and it's the kids. Anticipation of waiting for the presents that are to come. And Christmas Eve is loaded with anticipation because on Christmas Day, everything is about to change. Everything is about to change. There's a reason that th that time historically has been divided between the point of Jesus' birth, right? That's the, that's, the, that's the dividing point. That's the center point of all of history. Everything changed. Things are different after the birth of Jesus. We first have a new covenant. The Old Testament had the covenant that was set up between Israel and God and the sacrificial systems that went along that, the festivals and all the things that went with that. And that was the Old Covenant. But now we have the New Covenant. It comes, we have faith in Christ is what brings us salvation, what's bring, what brings us in community with God. We have a new peace. The new peace is the reality that is actual the reality is revealed to us. God's reality. We have a new hope. Understanding that Christ will someday return. And that's a great promise that we have that we can cling to. And of course, a new purpose. But now we are Christ's ambassadors. We are called to go and to share the good news. So we gather together on this day to reflect on that anticipation. To put ourselves, if you will, in that story. The night before Jesus' birth. But not everyone was filled with anticipation on that first Christmas Eve. My family, we have sort of built a culture of surprise. Especially for our kids. We love a, a big reveal of an unexpected trip or an unexpected experience or an unexpected visitor. Some examples, maybe it was texting the girls while they were in school to tell them that as soon as they get home, we're going to jump in a car and drive all night to go to their first Chiefs game, a playoff game nonetheless. Maybe it's Granny and Aunt Lindsay along with the cousins showing up at church and that lobby back there on Super Bowl Sunday all the way from Arkansas, just to come and watch the game with us together. Maybe it was Nate and Alana just a couple weeks ago making a surprise trip to Texas to see Grandma and Grandpa before they headed back to Tennessee. Just last week, it was Granny and Lainey showing up to watch Riley's last marching band performance at the UIL Championships. We love these kind of surprises. And inevitably, when those types of plans are made, there's one question. The question is, should we tell them or should it be a surprise? Because really, both can be good, right? Both can be good options. The decision is between anticipation and surprise. Anticipation is good. In every one of those examples I shared, if the plans were made known, then those would have uh, involved would have something exciting to look forward to. We could have said, hey, uh, we're going to go to a Chiefs game. And they could have looked forward to that. Hey, you, you know, your, your cousins are coming down to watch the Super Bowl. They could have looked forward to it. We could have told Grandma and Grandpa, hey, get ready, Nate and Alana are going to be here. All those things. You could have the anticipation of, of that good experience before you. But, at least in our family, more often than not, we opt for the surprise. Because unexpected good in this life is a very special thing. It's very hard to come by. There's a lot of unexpected in our lives. But the unexpected good is a little more difficult to come by. Well, I think maybe God and the Beard family are on the same wavelength, at least in this regard. Because even though we focus on the anticipation of Christmas Eve in the past, maybe, just maybe, we should have been focusing on the surprise. Because if you think about it, not many were in on what was about to happen. Joseph of and Mary, of course, they, they knew exactly what was coming. Some of the, the family knew. We, we know through the, the book of Luke and, and uh, John the Baptist leaping in his womb when, he, when, when Mary came in to see uh, his mother. And, and we got, you know, heaven, of course, obviously. But not many others. Not many others knew what was coming. No, if you think about it, that first Christmas Eve felt more like our 7th 
than our December 24th. Now, I don't know about you, but February 7th means absolutely nothing to me. I tried to pick a random date that means nothing. It's a pretty mundane part of the year. You know, school has just gotten back into full swing. The weather is really not that great yet. I suppose maybe you have Valentine's Day to look forward to if that's your thing. But generally, February 7th is just another day. It's just another day. And on Christmas Eve, the crowds of people were probably just annoyed that they had to travel for the census. Just another day. On Christmas Eve, Herod was probably just going about his business, not actually caring about any babies. Just another day. On Christmas Eve, the shepherds were taking care of the sheep without much hope that anything truly exciting was going to happen. It was just another day. And on Christmas Eve, the nation of Israel had endured 400 years of silence from God and probably to a certain extent had forgotten about any promises of the Messiah. And even if they did remember, they had no idea that the promise would be fulfilled within hours. Just another day. But God knew. For God, the introduction of the Messiah was not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And the when was that first Christmas morning when everything could finally be set into motion. And so for most of the world, Christmas Eve didn't mean a whole lot. But that didn't change the magnitude of what happened the very next day. So my question, my question tonight is this. What does Christmas Eve feel like for you today? If you're like me, you probably feel a whole lot more like the world in general than you feel like Mary tonight. You feel a whole lot more like the world felt on that first Christmas Eve than you feel like Mary. I mean, we're excited to some extent about Christmas. We certainly praise God for the gift of Christ. But the truth is that we may be a lot more like the nation of Israel than we realize. Because that baby was born in Bethlehem, then the words of that great Christmas hymn that we sang tonight, O Holy Night, they do ring true, that long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared, and the soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder brings a new and glorious morn. But despite the greatness and the magnitude of our salvation, we still feel the reality of what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 22, where he said, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And in the midst of that groaning and pain, even though we know about the hope, even though we know about the great things that came about because of the birth of Christ, it's still hard to make this into more than just another day. We wait for the ultimate hope of Christ's return, or at least God's intervention for in a broken world. But that, that honestly, that, that intervention doesn't seem to be imminent to us. But remember, the nation of Israel waited for the coming of the Messiah, or at least a message from God, or a respite from Roman occupation, and it seemed like that day would never come. Certainly, on Christmas Eve, it felt that way. But God, in his time, kept his promise. And little, little, did, little did they know on Christmas Eve, on just another day, that it was just hours away. And who knows that maybe we are also just as close to an intervention by God. I like the way Chuck Wallace put it. He talked about how God revealed in his time after just another day. So I need that reminder today. I need to know that in any area of my life, God's response to my prayers and dreams might just be just hours away. It might be in need in other ways. Perhaps God will save my unbelieving loved ones within days. I'll get words of all of these raised up with missionaries who engage that people group for whom I've been praying. He'll unexpectedly answer that one vocational question I've been asking for years. He'll powerfully heal the marriage of a couple for whom I've been interceding. He'll He's just about to free my friend from drug addiction and seem to be pulling him from deeper and deeper into bondage. 
God's working in such a way that even now my friend's wayward son is running home again. He's about to surprisingly bring revival to a struggling and fighting church. I love the healer is preparing to mend the body of a friend who's facing cancer. That I'll wake up tomorrow with a renewed sense of clarity and for a purpose that perhaps, just maybe, joy will come in the morning. Christmas Eve reminds me to press on, to keep believing, to cling to hope, to always look forward. God's answer might be just around the corner. It could. Who knows what the next hours hold for us. So tonight, as we celebrate the promises that were fulfilled starting on that Christmas morning, let us also realize that God, in His time, will fulfill all promises. And it may actually be closer than we think. But in the meantime, God has actually given us a reminder to stay focused, to help us stay focused. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. For you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We take communion on this Christmas Eve because the birth of Jesus cannot be separated from his death and resurrection. We take communion on this Christmas Eve because we celebrate the gift of God that went well beyond the baby in Bethlehem. We take communion on this Christmas Eve because we must remember that God's fulfilled promises might just be right on the As we prepare to take communion this evening, let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift you've given to us the gift that started not just in Bethlehem, but back in Abraham. Your plan, Lord, to redeem your people, to bring salvation. And the way you gave a picture to the world of what it would be like to be in a covenant relationship with the Creator. And then, just as you promised, you brought Jesus. Born in Bethlehem. And that was only the beginning that he gave us then a life to exemplify teachings, to understand and apply in our life. And then, of course, his death and his resurrection was defeated, sin, and death. But, Lord, at times it's, uh, it's easy to get lost in the here and now, in the just any other day feeling. Help us to remember that you do keep your promises. And that today, or tomorrow, or any day we encounter, might just be the key of the fulfillment of that promise. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Sandra, Lord. Please. I was thinking about this time that we have too, and over the years, this candle has represented a lot of things. We've talked about what it can represent and what it has represented. And most typically, I like to go to the illustration of us being the light of the world and that we are together a bright light for Christ. And I certainly believe that to be the case. But today, again, in light of the year we've had and in the anticipation of fulfilled promises, I think of Isaiah 42 where Isaiah writes, a, bree, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And I believe that this light this time is, represents that light of hope. Even if it's just a glimmer, we understand that it's true, and in Christ it is real. And it's because of that that we can truly have joy despite the circumstances we find ourselves in. And so... It's apropos that tonight we're going to close with the song, Joy to the World. And I thank you for coming and joining us this evening. Christmas.